some changes to the standard. We always have talked about the 10 foot rule in the past where if the line is 50,000 volts, up to 50,000 volts, we're 10 feet away. Now that's going to change. The new number is going to be 20 feet that we have to determine. If it's 20 feet away, then there's no further action required we can see here. And that's for up to 350,000 volts. If it's over 350,000 volts and where the standard says 20 feet, we have to substitute in 50 feet. The thought is that most uh, service encountered by crane operators is going to be under 350,000 volts, so the 20 feet of clearance would apply. If we are within the 20 foot uh, area, uh, we have three options we can choose from. Option one is de energize and ground the power line. Option two, we maintain the 20 foot of clearance. Option three, ask utility uh, for the voltage and use table A with minimum approach distances. So if we're using option two or option three, we have to have a planning meeting. And that would be with the crane operator, site supervisor, lift director, riggers, signal persons, everyone involved, and the utility owner, the power line company, to determine these voltages and the, the distances we're trying to maintain. If taglines are used, they need to be a non-conductive type of tagline. Also, if the rigging uh, were non-conductive, would be the recommendation there as well. If we have warning lines established, they have to be elevated warning lines. In the past, we would mark off the distance and have a paint line on the ground. Uh, the new standards talk about elevated warning lines so that it's more uh, clearly visible to the crane operator. Plus, you would have to choose one of the following additional precautions, a proximity alarm, a dedicated spotter whose sole job is to maintain those distances from the power lines, the clearance is required, warning device, range limiter, or insulating link. If we take a look at table A, we can see there that up to 350,000 volts, we are 20 feet away. That is our requirement. So that is the basis for the new 20-foot rule. Uh, in the past, up to 50,000 volts were 10 feet away. The voltage increases by 150,000 volts, and the distance requirement increased by 5 feet. That holds true until we get to the bottom of our table, where between 500 and 750,000 it increases by 250,000 volts, and the distance increases by 10 feet. So this table has really always been in place in the ASME standards. Now with the new OSHA standards and the PDAC committee are trying to do is to put this right in the OSHA standard so we don't have to go look for it. It's right there for our use. It's more user friendly. Uh, we don't have to use uh, math to determine these distances. We can refer to the chart there for us. If we are working inside table A zone, we must show that staying outside the zone is infeasible. It's infeasible to de-energize and ground. And then if that is the case, we have to have all the following requirements. The power line owner, that's the minimum approach distance. We have a planning meeting with everyone involved on the job site. Again, the dedicated spotter, uh, different from the signal person. The signal person is directing the movement of the crane. Now the spotter, they're maintaining those distances that are established. They don't signal the crane. Their sole job is to act as the dedicated spotter. We would need to have elevated warning lines so they're clearly visible to the crane operator. Uh, insulating link device, non-conductive rigging, also tag lines that we talked about, non-conductive there. Range limiter if equipped with the machine. And again, the non-conductive tag line I mentioned. Barricade not only from the prohibited zone, but also from the equipment 10 feet from the machine so that no one can get near the machine working inside table A zone. Limit access to essential employees only, grounding the crane, and then deactivating any automatic re-energizer if the power line should trip. We don't want it to re-energize there. So we've definitely talked about some power line requirements here today. Um, on the last slide, this is an accident that I took a look at um, a few years ago where they were setting a track to a roller coaster and amusement park ride here. And the ground conditions weren't ideal. Uh, we did, they didn't have enough cribbing, matting set under the outriggers. So I'd like to show this one. This is a good example of the indirect cost of accidents. A lot of 
times we think about that direct cost where what is the cost to repair the, the foundation, the track, the, the crane in this case. Those would be the direct costs, also the indirect costs if we count all the people involved with uh, getting this crane turned back over and, and making things right. You can see there there's at least eight people in the picture, and I'm taking the picture myself. There's about 15 or 20 people behind me that you don't see here uh, from the owner, the general contractor, people that aren't too happy about this accident. So the ability to do future work at this project um, some of the, the classic indirect results here today. And that should conclude our presentation.